let us with open hearts and ears, attending to God's word, hear the law of our Father, God who has saved us from our sins, now speaks to us and tells us how we are to thankfully live before his face and how we are to express our love to him for what he has done for us, his children. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. We also give our attention to the words of our Savior, our elder brother. In Matthew 22, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Responding to God's law, we sing from Psalter 426. Versification of Psalm 116. We will sing stanzas 1, 5, 7, and 9. 1, 5, 7, and 9, 4, 26.
Let us unite our hearts and draw near to our Father's throne of grace in congregational prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Thou who hast loved us, loved Thy people with an everlasting love, hast drawn us to Thyself to be Thy children and heirs through Jesus Christ, and who has crowned us with loving kindness and tender mercy, undeserved yet freely given, not because of any worthiness in us, but because of the exceeding greatness and unfathomable depths of Thy own goodness, we come to Thee and we praise Thee and we worship Thee. We make the words of the psalmist our own, that knowing the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ, it is our joy to be Thy servant, bound yet free, and to render unto Thee as a token of our love for Thee, a life of gratitude, of obedience to Thy commandments, and of devout prayer through the operation of Thy Spirit in us, who is the author of every good fruit in the lives of Thy children. Having heard Thy law, we do confess our sins, that often we are foolish and disobedient children that do not keep the law Thou hast given us, even though Thou hast taken us from the house of bondage into Thy own house and made us temples of Thy Spirit, still too often we go back to the old ways of the house of bondage and ensnare ourselves in sin. Too often we turn our backs on Thee for those pleasures of sin which turn to ash in the mouth. Forgive us, Father, for Jesus' sake, and let us find grace in Thy sight, and let our faith find comfort in Thy favor, for Thy mercy never fails, and Thy faithfulness endures forever. Make us to rejoice in the joy of our salvation, and in the excellency of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord, through whom we have redemption and reconciliation with Thee, through whom our scarlet sins are made whiter than the snow, and by Thy Spirit empower us and give us the will and desire henceforth as children and heirs to live unto Thee, rendering unto Thee the glad and free obedience of love and looking with hopeful expectation for the fullness of our inheritance which shall at the appointed time come into our possession. We are in many ways living as exiles here, looking unto the house which is ours, the house which is from heaven, our lasting dwelling place, and for that city which hath foundations. And we pray that Thou wilt presently and quickly gather us thereto. Gather Thy children into Thy house. From every corner of the, of the world, bring them from the north and from the south, from the east and from the west, from all the coasts of the earth, and let Thy kingdom come. And we pray that Father, that Thou wilt care for us as Thy children and supply our needs. How needy we are. Impress this reality upon us. As we live in the midst of this world in which man vaunts himself, and proclaims his own greatness and points to all of his inventions, all of his technology, all of the ways that he has mastered, or so it seems to him, the powers of the creation. Man puffs himself up with pride, and easily we partake of the spirit of our age. May we be children, consciously children, who depend upon Thee, our Father, for all things. And may we not seek to exercise a sort of independence that is not ours and may never be ours. For we are creatures. Thou art the Creator. We are children. Thou art our Father. And so in faith we look to Thee, asking Thy blessing upon our families. Strengthen us spiritually that our homes may be built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and Thy Word, that they may be places where the Gospel is lived, where the love of Christ is known, and where we show it to one another. We ask the same for our spiritual family, this congregation, that it may be a place where the gospel is known and lived and shown to one another. Banish all bitterness, strife, and wrath from our midst. And equip us to 
be servants one of another. Even as the Lord Jesus washed His disciples' feet, though He was master of all, may we take upon ourselves the privilege and follow in our Lord's footsteps, ministering to one another in true Christian love. We ask Thy blessing upon all of the different members of our congregation. Be with our young people. Be their God, whoever draws nigh unto them. Bless them in their walk of life. Give them strong faith that grows and that clings to the gospel, which is the only light and hope and joy that there is in this world. Give them and give us all the ability to see through the lies of the devil and the call of sin which says to us that true joy and pleasure is found in forsaking thy ways and making our own way. But that leads only unto death. May we walk in thy ways and in the light of thy truth. Give us sober minds that we may see thy truth and see the lie for what it is and live as children of the light. We pray also that thou wilt be with the aged of our congregation as they are in a different stage of their earthly pilgrimage. Bless them and keep them and cause thy face to shine upon them and use them still to be a great blessing to the body that the wisdom thou hast given to them through many years of pilgrimage may be imparted to the rest of the body and to the young especially. We pray that thou wilt be with the shut-ins and those who cannot gather with us in this public assembly Be near to them and may they experience the rest of the Sabbath day. The widowed in our midst who each day feel the pain of their bereavement. Keep them, Father, and comfort them with thy word. Grant the single members of the congregation what they need. Those who have no children of their own yet desire them. Comfort them too in thy way with them. May thy gifts of contentment be granted to us all. For whatever our earthly way is, the temptation is always to be discontent, to think that thy way is not the best way. Yet even when thy way leads us through dark places and hard times, it is the best way. For thou art our Father, who is all wise, and who knows precisely what we need. And even when thou dost extend a chastening hand to us, it is what we need. Many are the specific needs of others in our congregation, and we bring those too before thy throne of grace. The sick, we ask for their healing according to thy will. The downcast, that thou wilt uplift their hearts. That thou wilt relieve the worried and help the helpless and bind up the brokenhearted. And may thy fatherly care so reach and attend to each of thy children that they may find their refuge and their rest in thee. Grant thy blessing upon thy people everywhere. Thou knowest their names, for thou hast called them to be thy own, and given thy Son for their redemption. Many are their needs, many are their afflictions. Thy people in our own land and in every land, help them and keep them in thy fatherly care. Grant that Christ's work throughout the world may accomplish its mission, that thy people be gathered and the day of Christ brought nigh. We ask that thou wilt strengthen and bless the office bearers of our congregation, our deacons, our elders, our pastor, that through their work, Christ's work may be done, and that in their weakness, Christ's power may be magnified, and that we as a congregation may be built up. We ask thy blessing upon our worship, Glorify thyself in this service, not unto us, but unto thee be all glory given through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray all these things. Amen. As we give of our offerings, we do so in the spirit of 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. First collection this morning is for the general fund, and the second is for benevolence.
Psalter 395, versification of Psalm 145. We'll sing the four stanzas, all four, 395.
We open the Holy Scriptures to Isaiah 64. Let us read the Word of God, Isaiah 64, the entire chapter. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence, as when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down, The mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. In those is continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Be not wroth very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Thy holy cities are a wilderness, Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praised thee is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? Thus far we read the word of God. On the basis of this passage and the entire scriptures, we receive the instruction of the Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 46, explaining to us the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. Lord's Day 46 begins with question 120, which asks, Why hath Christ commanded us to address God thus? Our Father. That immediately in the very beginning of our prayer, he may excite in us a childlike reverence for and confidence in God, which are the foundation of our prayer, namely, that God is become our Father in Christ and will much less deny us what we ask him in true faith than our parents will refuse us earthly things. Why is it here added, which art in heaven? Lest we should form any earthly conceptions of God's heavenly majesty, and that we may expect from his almighty power all things necessary for soul and body. Beloved in the Lord, when Jesus teaches us to pray in the Lord's prayer, he wastes no words. The opening words, our Father which art in heaven, sometimes called the preface to the Lord's Prayer, more often referred to as the address of the Lord's Prayer, these opening words are as meaningful and instructive for us as the six petitions which follow. In fact, so important are these opening words that in the middle of answer 120, we are told that they express the foundation of our prayer, the foundation of all Christian prayer, the foundation upon which every true prayer is built. Our Father, 
which art in heaven. Those words brim with significance. Not only because they identify the object of our prayers, that is the one to whom we pray, they do that. We pray to the one only true and living God and none other. But crucial for us to see, and the main thrust of these opening words, is that they show us who this one true God is to you and to me. Who he is to his believing people and who we are to him. These opening words of the Lord's Prayer, therefore, are expressing to us a relationship that exists by grace through Christ between us and the one true and living God. That is the deepest significance of these words. We are the children of God. God and he is our father and this relationship exists because of the only begotten son Jesus Christ who paid for our sins and reconciled us to God and has made us heirs of all things with him and it is in the context of that relationship that we are taught to pray and it is within that relationship that we are able to pray with true worshipful reverence, true genuine love, and childlike confidence and certainty of being heard. The address of the Lord's Prayer is the watershed of the whole prayer. It's the foundation. So important it is, and thus fitting, that we consider it this morning. Our Father which art in heaven, We're going to look at these words from three respects. We're going to see that they're wonderful words. Secondly, that they're foundational words. And thirdly, that they're comforting words. In Matthew 6 verse 9, when Jesus answered his disciples' request, Lord, teach us to pray, he said, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. And those opening words of the model prayer must have struck the twelve disciples with wonder. Indeed, they must have been quite a surprise for the disciples to hear. From our vantage point in covenant history, the surprise of the words, Our Father, can sometimes be a little bit lost upon us. And even the wonder of these words, if we don't think carefully about it, can be lost upon us because these words have become so commonplace. And that's one of the blessings of being a Christian in the New Testament age, that we come to God and pray to Him as our Father. We are taught these words from our earliest days if we've grown up in a Christian home. But these words were something new to the twelve disciples. Jesus here teaches them to pray in a way they had not prayed before. uh, To address God in a way they had not addressed Him before. At least not this directly. Jesus prayed this way. And it is in the prayers of Jesus that we see this address come to prominence. But now He tells them to pray this way? To come to the living God and say, Our Father? Make no mistake... God's people in the Old Testament knew God as a father. They knew that they were his children. But there was a certain distance. There was less clarity and fullness of this revealed truth. We have the fullness now in the New Testament age after the coming and work of Jesus Christ. But in the Old Testament there was a certain distance. Less clarity and fullness. And we see that when we look at the prayers of the Old Testament saints. If you study the Old Testament, you'll find many prayers recorded there. For example, think of Solomon's great prayer at the dedication of the temple. And we read his address to God in 1 Kings 8 verse 23 where he says, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee. Beautiful address. Or the prayer of Hezekiah in 2 Kings 19 verse 15 where he says, 
O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubim, Thou art the God, even Thou alone. The beautiful prayer of confession, Daniel. Daniel 9 verse 4, where Daniel says, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love Him and to them that keep His commandments. Beautiful addresses of the heart, from the heart of these Old Testament saints. And yet you notice, and you'll notice this if you look at many of the other prayers as well, none of them say, Our Father, which art in heaven. Even if you turn to the Bible's own prayer book, the Psalms, which contain a multitude of beautiful prayers and addresses to God, you won't find a psalm that begins, Our Father, which art in heaven. This was something new. Now, as I said a moment ago, the Old Testament saints knew God as Father, and that's clear from the passage which we read in Isaiah 64, particularly verse 8, where the prophet Isaiah on behalf of the elect people in Judah, cries out to God, O Lord, Thou art our Father, we are the clay, and Thou our potter, and we all are the work of Thy hand. God as the Father of Israel goes way back, goes all the way back to the Exodus. In Exodus 4 verse 22, God sent Moses to Pharaoh. And these are the words that God told Moses to say to Pharaoh. Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And so the, the people of God in the Old Testament knew themselves to be the children of God. And yet there was that distance. They knew that God was the father of his people who loved his people. And yet they stopped short of calling upon him in this direct, warm, intimate way. Our father. They could say, thou art our Father. They could say as in Psalm 103 verse 13, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. But they didn't go this far to say, our Father which art in heaven. When Jesus taught his disciples the Lord's Prayer, there was a marvelous step forward in God's revelation to his people. Jesus now teaches His people to address Him directly. Not simply, Thou art our Father, declaring that beautiful reality of salvation, but to speak to Him as a child speaks to a father. My Father, our Father. And that makes sense that Christ would be the one to teach His people to pray this way because Christ is the one through whom God has become our Father. It's His finished work. His work on the cross. His life of obedience. Which takes the covenant relationship that God has established with His people. And brings it to a warmth and intimacy of fellowship. So much higher than ever before. He is the one who gives us liberty and boldness to approach God in prayer. For He Himself is the way, the truth, and the life. Our access unto the Father. What was revealed yet still partly veiled in the Old Testament, Christ brings fully to light. He is the one through, his, through whose finished work, through His finished work, He has cut in half every veil that stands between us as children and God our Father. He is the new and living way. If you want to put all of salvation in simple, relational, covenantal terms, think of salvation this way. Salvation is Jesus making His Father our Father. Salvation is the only begotten Son of God coming down into our flesh in order that through His work He might bring many sons and daughters to glory. And the essence of that glory is fellowship with the Father. Salvation is the only begotten Son Entering our flesh to become our elder brother. That we might be joint heirs of Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. Of the Father's inheritance. That's what is standing behind. The address of the Lord's prayer. Our Father. And so now as we finish up the first point. 
let's pause for a moment and concentrate our hearts and minds on what a wonder that is. So that the wonder and the surprise and the joy that brims in these words is not lost on us because of how commonplace these words have become. God is your Father for Jesus' sake. Do you believe in Christ, people of God? Those who believe on Christ, have the one true and living God, the Holy One, as their Father. That is a wonder of grace. In your mind, you flip back to the beginning of the book of Isaiah. You think of perhaps one of the most well-known passages in Isaiah. Isaiah 6, the prophet's vision of the holy God within his throne room. And the room is full of smoke. The pillars and the door frames shake at the voice of the one sitting upon the throne. The seraphim veil their eyes and cover their feet in the presence of the holy one as they cry out, Holy, holy, holy. That's God. And Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, as he, in this vision, stands before the face of the holy God. And in these words of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, you come to that God, and you stand before his presence, and you say, our Father, which art in heaven. A wonder, an absolute wonder, accomplished by Christ, who came and on the cross atoned for our sins. And in that work, he was fulfilling the decree of God. For as Ephesians 1 verse 5 tells us, God predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself. God, in eternity past, in the liberty of His own divine being, chose to set His love upon His elect people. He chose them in eternity for His children. And then in the fullness of time, He sent Jesus Christ into the world. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. We've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. We've been ransomed from sin's clutches and from the devil's claws. We've been reconciled to the Holy One before whom the seraphim veil their eyes, so that that Holy God we may call Father. And may come to Him in the warmth and intimacy of a personal relationship. That's what Christ has done for us. We've been adopted by the blood of Christ. Our legal status now before God is that of son, that of daughter. So that we are admitted into God's everlasting covenant of grace. His eternal family. And we have all the rights and privileges of joint heirs with Christ. And that legal aspect of our salvation is just one beautiful half of it. Because of the redemptive work of Christ on the cross, the Father sends the Spirit of the Son to dwell in our hearts. And the Spirit of the risen Christ raises us from death unto newness of life with Him. Translating us out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Refashioning us in the image of God. We are given a second birth. Not from the womb of our earthly mother, but from the womb of God's sovereign grace. Begotten again unto a lively hope. And that Spirit of Christ dwells in our hearts. So that as Romans 8 verse 15 says. Ye have received the Spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry. Abba Father. That's a wonder. That's the wonder. That stands behind our prayers. Even though you and I are still great sinners. Isaiah 64. Verse 6. Is still true of you and me. From the point of view of ourselves. 
But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. That's still true of us. We are fallen people, sinners, but nonetheless we are sons of God, daughters of the Father. God has become our Father for Jesus' sake. Our sonship, our daughterhood is not of our own making or our own maintaining. We are adopted and born again into this spiritual family of God. And as verse 8 tells us, it's the work of the Father. He is the potter. He's the potter who shaped our bodies out of the dust of the ground. He is the one who knit us together in our mother's womb. And he is the creator of us spiritually. He has given us that new life by the power of the Spirit of Christ. He has kindled that faith in your heart. Salvation. Covenant. Our relationship with God is His work. The work of the Father Potter. Just as we had no say in our physical birth, we had no say in our spiritual rebirth. Thanks be to God for that. To work His marvelous, marvelous grace. A work of almighty grace that cannot be undone. The devil can't change it. No man can change it. No power of hell can ever change it. You can't change it. You and your wandering and straying as a sheep can't change it. The Father has set His love upon His people. And He's set his glor- the glory of His name as a seal upon it. You are His. He has made you His. And because you are His, these wonderful words are put in your heart and on your lips. And let us bask in the light of their beautiful significance. Our Father which art in heaven. That wonder is foundational. And that's what the catechism focuses our attention upon. This wonder of our father-child relationship with God in the covenant of grace based upon the work of Jesus Christ. This wonder is the foundation of our prayers. That's what answer 120 calls our attention to. It asks, why does Jesus teach us to pray with these opening words, our Father which art in heaven? And the purpose of Christ is that immediately... In the very beginning of our prayer, he might excite in us a childlike reverence for and confidence in God, which are the foundation of our prayer, namely that God has become our Father in Christ. And you see the point that's being made here. When we understand with the heart the meaning of these opening words of the Lord's Prayer, it opens up the gate to prayer. Because the God we pray to is our Father. It's not enough simply to know that there is an almighty God out there to whom we pray. We need to know what is that almighty God's view towards me. Why should that almighty God pay any attention to me? He is lofty. He is high. He is exalted. He is perfect. And I am a lowly creature of the dust. I am a sinner. What possible right do I have to approach him? What possible reason is there for me to think he's going to give me, if we may speak this way, a moment of his time? We must know something more than that there is a God and that he is an almighty God and that he is there and that he is eternal and that he is omnipresent and all of the rest. Though that is an important part of the necessary knowledge we must have to pray. Prayer arises From the relationship of the covenant God has established with us by grace. And that's foundational. That's the foundation. When the catechism speaks about a foundation, it's drawing on images from the construction site. You think of the building of a house. What's absolutely essential for that structure to be built and for it to stay built? You have to have a foundation. A solid base that's firm, that gives stability and strength and structure to all of the bricks that are placed on top of it. And so it is with prayer. 
If we're going to make these petitions in the Lord's Prayer, we have to have a foundation upon which to place them, like you would place blocks. If you don't know God as Father, the God of your salvation through Jesus Christ, you can't build those blocks of prayer. Just for an example, the fifth petition. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. How can you possibly say that to the Holy One if you don't have this foundation? God is become my Father through Jesus Christ. You can't. You can't. This wonder is the basis, the foundation upon which all true prayer rests. And that brings out an important application. When we approach the subject of prayer, we feel our own weakness in our prayer lives. I don't pray enough. I don't pray as fervently as I ought. And, and the list can go on and on. And we all can think of weaknesses in our own prayer lives. The temptation can be to see prayer as this obligation I have to fulfill. And that's not completely wrong. Prayer is an obligation. The previous Lord's days have told us that. God commands us to pray. But the address of the Lord's Prayer teaches that something else should be first in our mind. The wonder. If anything will get us to pray, if anything will make us want to pray, if anything will give us confidence to approach God even in our weak moments and with our weak prayers, it's this, the wonder of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. The relationship that we have with this God. The relationship that's not of our own making, not of our own maintaining, but only of His sovereign grace. That wonder, when it sinks into the heart, when it penetrates your soul, that wonder is the spring from which prayer jumps forth. So the application is this. Stand in awe before God. Behold His glory. Behold the wonder of His salvation. What He's done for you. When that wonder is in your heart, prayer will follow. Prayer will flow. And from the very beginning, it will be fervent. Because you can't say the words, Our Father, except in love. That's the foundation of our prayers. The covenant relationship God has made with us. Now that foundation, as we build upon it, as we pray, in the awareness that God is our Father, this will lead to certain deep-seated feelings of the soul, we might call them, or dispositions of the spiritual mind. And that's what the Catechism brings out, the start of answer 120, when it speaks of childlike reverence and childlike confidence. The way to understand that is when the child of God is living in the awareness of his father-son, father-daughter relationship with God, as he stands in awe at the wonder of it, there will arise in his heart true reverence for this God and Father and true confidence in this God and Father. And those deep-seated feelings of the soul will fill his petitions, fill his praise, fill his thanksgivings. They will pervade all of his prayer. Childlike reverence, childlike confidence. Let's look at those a moment. But before we do, let's not pass over the well chosen adjective, childlike. The writers of the Catechism picked that for a reason childlike. We are God's children. That's our deepest identity as believers. And that means we must, from a spiritual perspective, be childlike. Childlike in our prayer. Childlike in our worship. Childlike in all of our life of faith before the face of God. Like children. Now we understand the, different, the difference between childish and childlike. Childishness and childlikeness. To be childish is, that's negative. 
When somebody's childish, it means they behave in an immature, foolish way, or they lack understanding such that they are easily fooled and easily make mistakes and easily make a mess of things. Childishness is not a good thing. But childishness is different from childlikeness. In the scriptures, childlikeness refers to being simple in the good sense of the word, simple towards that which is evil, trusting dependent, unquestioning and undoubting, showing an eagerness to learn and to grow more and more, a willingness to accept and believe what the Father says. And that's the spiritual characteristic believing children of God ought to exhibit. And that's a spiritual characteristic that this wonder This foundation of prayer, the words, our Father which art in heaven, cultivates in our hearts. Childlikeness. That's why Jesus in Matthew 18 verse 3 says that part of being converted to him is to become as little children. This is how we look at God. This is how we view God. This is how we think of God as we approach that throne of grace. And as we live before Him in our everyday lives, praying without ceasing, this is how we look at Him. This is how we look at self. Father, I, His child. He as Almighty Father is the one who provides and cares for me and rules me by His good word. And I submit myself to Him. I obey Him and gladly so. And I trust Him. I depend upon Him. I look to Him. For all things. He speaks to me and I take him at his word. I don't question. I don't doubt. But I rely entirely. For all things body and soul. On him. My father. That's childlikeness. And that's one of those mysteries about the Christian spiritual life. It's different from our earthly life. In our earthly life, as we mature, we become less childlike and more adult-like. But when it comes to spiritual things, the most spiritually mature believer is the one who's most childlike. The more we mature in the faith, the more we become like spiritual children. So, let's put away from ourselves every thought being independent, being strong of ourselves, being those who do it on their own without the help of others, without the help of God. No, childlike. Now the two characteristics that the catechism points out. Childlike reverence comes first. Reverence. Very important. Because even though we are in this warm and intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So that we can come to him and say, Father. That doesn't change the fact that our Father is still the God on the throne in Isaiah 6. That the seraphim don't dare look at. He's holy. Isaiah 57 verse 17 says this of God. Says this of your father and mine, that he is high and lofty, the one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. This God is still holy other, and therefore he deserves our respect. And that's what reverence is. It's respect. When you show reverence to someone, you respect them, you hold them in high regard on account of their position. And God holds the highest position. He's the high and lofty one. Why? Because of who he is. He's God. And therefore, in every thought, in every motion of my heart, in every action of my hands, in every aspect of my being, he deserves my reverence and my worship. That's childlike, isn't it? In the context of a healthy child-father relationship, that little child reveres father in a certain sense. Doesn't he or doesn't she? Looks up to Father, who's strong, who provides, and whose love is protective and nourishing and nurturing and cherishing. 
that little child admires father and even fears father in the right sense of the word. Fear, not terror. Not terrified because father is a man with a short temper or father is a man who comes home and the child has no idea what father is going to do when he gets home. That must not be the case. There, as an aside, is an application for us fathers. We must take heed to ourselves. As fathers, in a special way, we reflect to our children the fatherhood of God. Let us not give our children a disfigured portrait of God by the way we carry ourselves in the home. But let us, by the grace of God, reflect the love of God We can't do it perfectly, we fathers. We are fallen sinners. We make mistakes. We stumble. We sin against our wife and our children. We do. And there's forgiveness for that. Tremendous forgiveness in the grace of God. But the application is this. We must not be men who are unstable, who are temperamental, who are cruel, who are harsh. The greatest damage that can be done is what it does to our children's perspective of the Father. The Father. But again, in a healthy relationship, there's reverence. And that's the kind of reverence that we have for our God. And how much more since we are His redeemed, blood-bought, adopted, regenerated children who have received everything good from Him. We revere Him. And that ought to be evident in all of our life. Because the Christian life is a life of prayer. We pray without seeing. We live this life before the face of God. As we go to work. As we labor in the home. As we go to school. As we shop. Everything. We live before the face of Father. And we want to revere Him. Honor Him in what we do. But in prayer also. That's why reverence is important in prayer. It's become fashionable in our day to be very informal in our prayers. We must be careful. We must be careful in how we speak to God. He deserves all of our reverence. Reverence that comes from the heart. Reverence of love. But now the Catechism points us to a second thing, and namely childlike confidence in prayer. And isn't that beautiful how these two are put together. Reverence, because God is high and lofty and above us, but also confidence. Because this high and lofty God is the God who's drawn near to us in Jesus Christ and draws us near to Him. There's a perfect balance that is struck here. The Almighty God, who is to be revered, and the loving Father, who is to be trusted, confided in, As Father, He loves you. That's what that name conveys to you, beloved. God here, in the address of the Lord's Prayer, calls Himself your Father. And that is a communication of His love towards you. And He's demonstrated that love in the giving of His only begotten Son for you. And if His love is that great, if He goes to such lengths for your salvation and mine, How can we doubt that He'll accept us? How can we doubt that He will give us all good? Just like a little child fully trusts his parents, even though he doesn't understand the ins and outs of life and how the necessities of life are gotten, he still trusts dad and mom that there will be food on the table, there will be clothing in the closet. So too the child of God trusts Father, even though we don't know the ins and outs of His plan for our lives, or even understand it fully when He leads us in a way that seems to us to be not the right way because of the suffering and the hardship that comes with that way, we trust, we trust. He's our Father who art in heaven. As we heard last Sunday morning, in heaven, isn't first of all pointing out where God is, but pointing out the kind of God He is. He's heavenly, He's exalted, He's almighty. He's the Father who is all-wise and almighty. And that means no good is beyond His ability to give us, and no evil is beyond His ability to protect us from. And thus, when evil does come upon us in our earthly way, it's under Father's control. 
and it's subservient to his purposes. Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And his good pleasure is supremely revealed in the work of Jesus Christ, our salvation. And thus, as Lord's Day 1 says, all things must be subservient to our salvation. And so we go to God with this confidence, this trust. Father cares for me. And Father is able to To give me what I need. And Father is able and will guide me through the rough and hard patches of this earthly pilgrimage. Father will never leave or forsake me. He is there. And he will always be there. Until the day I am with him. In his house. And so we see finally... But these words are comforting words, aren't they? And there's not a lot left to say because really the wonder and the foundation looking at those things, we've seen what comfort comes from these opening words of the prayer already. But there's a few things that we can underscore at the end of the sermon. First, the Lord's Prayer, its beginning stresses to us the ever-present recourse that we have to God in time of need. Prayer is a recourse. We are never alone or without help in this world. Why? Because our Father. We have the Almighty God as our Heavenly Father, and He is ever-present, and therefore we have a right to use the language of the Catechism to expect, and that's a strong word, isn't it? Expect from His Almighty power All things. God is our tower. God is our refuge. And there is no distress. There is no trouble. There is no trial. In which we will find him to be an insufficient refuge. Or a weak tower. Flee to him in prayer in your time of need. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5 verse 16 says. Sometimes we really don't believe that, do we? We ought to. Not because our prayers are so great, or that there's inherent strength in our prayer. No, but because of the one to whom we pray, who is so great, our Father. Our Father. There's comfort here for the last days. The one who is in control of our own darkening and increasingly threatening days is not merely the Almighty God who is pursuing His own ends, but is our Father who is pursuing the end of our eternal salvation. And so as the days darken, Towards the coming of Jesus Christ. And as it seems things are becoming more and more threatening in our society and in our world. For Christians and for the church. Let's remember who's on the throne. Who's in control. It's God our Father. Who's the perfect Father. Will any good Father ever let his child be destroyed by something that's under his control? Of course not. So it is with our perfect Father, even Antichrist himself, must be subservient to the church's salvation. And so we have that ever present recourse to God in prayer. Now, finally, let's see that that also gives us an ever present security in the perfect love of a perfect Father. God is a perfect Father. His love for us is strong, protective, nurturing, unconditional, unchanging. This is the love of God for His people. And that fatherly love is the rock. It's the rock that our whole being rests upon. No matter who we are, no matter what you've gone through, you have this rock. No matter how many men People in this world, family members, church members have failed you or hurt you. Whatever it may be, you have this rock. The love of God expressed in Christ 
and His redeeming work. And when you're on that rock, there's not a single storm that can dislodge you or destroy you. The child of God has perfect and eternal security in this wonderful relationship established by grace. You have a Father who will never fail or forsake you. Isaiah 49, verse 15 and 16. Can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? If there's any relationship where there is fierce, protective love, it's a mother's for her own child. It's almost inconceivable that a mother would forsake her child and yet, yea, they may forget. It's possible. But God says this, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Father has our names upon the palms of his hands. They're graven there. They can't be forgotten. And that's the assurance we have. That's the reason we have to pray. It's the reason we have to obey God's commandments. The wonder of what He's done for us. So let us ponder these opening words of the Lord's Prayer. From the heart, with fervent love, address God our Father. But even as we address God our Father, let us hear Father's words for us. Father's address to us. You're my child. I love you. Nothing can ever separate you from my love. Amen. Faithful God and Heavenly Father, teach us to pray. And teach us to pray from the heart these words our Lord has taught us to pray, our Father, which art in heaven. May the meaning of these words sink into our hearts so that we may come to Thee without terror or dread, but in boldness and in liberty as sons and daughters of Thee, and that we might found our lives upon the rock of Thy redeeming love. That as we live in these darkening days, amidst a threatening world, we not doubt that Thou shalt forever protect us and keep us till we stand before Thy face in glory. Bless Thy word unto our hearts. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's turn now to Psalter 278. 278. Stands as 1, 2, and 4. 1, 2, and 4 of 278.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.